Hello, my name is Jane Lofton, and I'm the teacher librarian at Miracosta High School. And I'm here to inter here today to interview David Terrio, who is a high school teacher at Fountain Valley High School. I had the pleasure of meeting last summer at the Google Teacher Academy in Mountain View. And we're going to be talking about blogging with students. And so, do you want to um, say any more? In Introduce yourself for a minute. Yeah, absolutely, Jane. Jane, thanks for inviting me. Uh, hi, everyone. I teach English at Fountain Valley High School. I've taught English for 20 years, and I've always had my students doing writing for audiences besides me, but be thanks to technology and my foray into blogging myself about starting about two and a half years ago, uh, after a semester of blogging myself personally, I decided like it was amazing. And so I was like, oh, I'm just going to have my students try it. And I've never looked back. And it's something I will do forever. And it's like, it's entered into my pantheon of things that I will never not do. Like, I will be blogging with my students for the rest of my life. That sounds like a good plan. <laughs> um, so can you share a little more about, you already did a bit about um, what made you decide to start having your students blog? Yeah, so um, ever since I started teaching, I would have kids do things like write online reviews. Like, do you remember e-opinions, right, or Amazon reviews or different, just any time there was something online? Or I would even, even I think before the Internet started, I would have kids write complaint letters to businesses, right? Yeah. And I just, they always enjoyed writing to anybody but me because if it was to me, it felt like score, but it was... If it was to even their peers, right, like exchanging writing that their peers are going to read notes, letters, things like that, they always kind of spark up a little bit because it seems real, right? Well, it is real, right? The act of writing and communicating is real. And so what, I, I was very hesitant to get online. Um, my friends basically dragged me onto Twitter and onto, you know, everywhere else and, and said I should try and, and blog. And I was really hesitant to do it. I, I, I did not want to be online. But then I realized I'm already online because I'm on RateMyTeacher.com. And so I was like, well, why should I let RateMyTeacher.com define who I am as a teacher? Like, I'll just start throwing some stuff out on my blog. And I started small, really short posts, just a picture. And then I got used to it. And what I really loved about it was to, to really know what you're thinking and how you feel about something, you've got to write it out, right? So in the act of writing, you're, you're processing and you're reflecting and you're organizing and then you're thinking about what is the core element of this thing that I'm thinking about that I want to communicate and share to other people. And in that process, you really get to understand the material better. So if we can do that for our students, right, where they reflect, what's this core? What do I want to share out? How do I want to share out? Am I going to organize it? It's, it's just a great tool. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> Obviously, we're doing this because I, I believe passionately that um, blogging for students is a way for them to find their voices and to reflect and to um, develop their expertise as as they write. Um, yeah, I, I have a student this year who does not want any attention. Like she does not want to promote her blog, and yet. She still loves doing the blog. She's writing about um, her sister who's really struggling with some, some issues I don't want to really get into. And the act of her writing and, and doing this has been really helpful for her. And she loves doing it. And she loves me reading it. And, and a couple other people have read it. But she, she's still uncomfortable. But even, even with the fact that she's not you know, promoting it and getting it out there and whatever else... Just that act of blogging and writing and reflecting is um, its super useful for her and her situation. Yeah, and I think blogging can run the gamut from, you know, very private, if if that's the kind of person you are, right. to be very public. Sure. And, and everything in between. Yeah. Um, could you share some, David, about the type of um, blog posts you have your students write? Okay, so... Basically, what I'm doing is students can write about anything they want to write about as long as it in some way ties back to what they learned over the last week or two in my class. And I usually what I do is I want them to reframe it. So 
you can call it, some people call it reframing, some people remixing, but so for example, um, this week in class, we were talking about, um, short sentences, like fragments, aposiopasis, uh, M dashes, um, ellipses, different things like that. So what is that like out in something else? So maybe it's, uh, students want to talk about their favorite short films. Maybe it's students want to talk about a, a moment in a baseball game that that one short little moment encapsulated everything, right? Just like a, a short little sentence would do in the middle of your writing. So I have them look to things that they're into, that they like, their sports, their activities, their, you know, video games, right? Um, whatever they like, and then related in some way to what we learned in class. And that way, they're taking what we learned in the class, they're applying it in a real way, they're they're making it relevant in their life and then they write about it. So I don't give them writing prompts every week to do. Um, this is much more personal than that, but I do want them to engage in whatever we're reading. It, it, you know, it might be what's coming up in Catcher on the Rye that we're reading. And there's a situation that happens and then how does that relate to their lives or their interest and then they write about it. That sounds like a great idea. So they have a lot of freedom, but they do have to tie it into something. Right, right. And, and then I'll give them a little uh, challenge every week. So, And the challenge is not topic-based. The challenge is procedurally based. So, for example, this past week was include some of those short sentences in your writing, you know, and then I'm going to look for how you use those. And it might be like one week I'll do use a, use a pull quote effectively. Or um, I want you to bring in an outside source, but I'd like you to format it so that the reference looks like it's MLA cited with a little work cited at the bottom, which real bloggers do. They'll put sometimes references at the bottom and they'll, you know, integrate it right into the writing. So I'll give them procedural challenges every week, just one. Um, and then that's what I look for when I'm, when I'm grading them and taking a look at them is besides just their writing and everything, I'm, I'll look for that one thing, that procedural challenge but then the topic is more open. And the nice thing also about having the open topic is I don't have to come up with topics every week. And I don't have to worry about, oh, some of the kids will like the topic and some won't like the topic. So just tie it back to the class, do the challenge, and then boom, you're all set to go. Yeah, sounds great. Um, one of the aspects that I love about blogging is that it really brings in all aspects of digital citizenship. So it's an opportunity to teach these students those skills and have them practice. But um, what sort of prep did you do in advance um, before they started blogging um, in terms of digital citizenship or, you know, any other skills that you felt they needed to have, you know, like front loaded before they began? Okay. I, I definitely talked with them. I would say about for a period. And we, a lot of what we cover though is in time. Like as it comes up, we talk about it and go through it. But I do, so none of my students, they all just use their first name only on their blog. And, and I, when I first started, I had them do nicknames, and that was a nightmare because I could never tell who was actually writing, and it was such a problem. And so if I have it by first name, then I can pretty much figure out who this is because I, I learned their voice and, and, and about their blogs. So first name only, no pictures of themselves on the blog, uh, no pictures of their friends with their names underneath it, um, really, I don't want them giving any kind of identifying stuff. Now, I do have kids who continue blogging after they've graduated, and at that point, if they want to, you know, come out to the world or share who they are, like, that's fine. But as far as if it's in my class, then I don't want there to be any identifying information and stuff. And then I also talk about, um, you know, you might have some people try and contact you through the comments thing. You don't know who these people are. Don't go meet somebody somewhere because they seem to like everything you like. And, you know, we talk about trolls and we talk about stalkers and we talk about all this other kind of stuff. So it's definitely, and I've had some kids bring comments to me and we look at them together. And uh, I, I had a student this year who she was followed by somebody called Sexy Music. And she was really worried about this, right? That this guy called Sexy Music is following her. Well, we, we went 
I actually went to go search him because she was even so uncomfortable. She didn't want to search him up. So I went and searched him up. I was really like, oh, what am I going to see? It was a, an 18 year old boy who's super into music. And he actually, he blogs about music and he, and, and, and about uh, teaching and learning music. Like he, he had a wonderful blog that was totally appropriate. He just picked the sexy music username. Um, so it was actually really cool. So I went back and I talked to her and I was like, oh yeah, this kid's like really nice kid. He's kind of nerdy and, you know, he's really into music. And so he likes your blog post about music and she was all felt better about it. So it was good. Oh, that's good. He might want to choose a different. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to make music sexy, Jane. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I know, like if, if music it needed any help being sexy. <laughs> um, how do your students like blogging? What sort of comments do, do you get from them? I, I they love it. Um, I if if you want if you go onto my site, I'll share it with you later. But you can actually see I have a present a blogging presentation. You can see kids' comments about their blogging, but I, you're blown away by their comments. I mean, kids say. You know, this is the first time I get to write about what I want to write about. This is the first time I had a voice. Kids, when they get likes, they just totally, you know, kids really are into those approval points, right? Those plus ones and things like that and those views. Uh, in We use WordPress. So in WordPress and the analytics, you can actually see what countries have viewed your blogs. And, oh, man, they go crazy, right? Like, you know, and these are teenagers. They're very jaded, but they're like... Mr. Terrio, somebody in Russia looked at my blog, or Mr. Terrio, somebody in Brazil is looking at my blog, and they get really excited, and they kind of share with each other what countries they're doing, and they love when they get comments from people, you know, because these aren't just comments from me, right? I'm supposed to give them comments, but these are comments from just some, like, think about all the things on the internet you can look at, right? YouTube, and this, and games, and whatever. Somebody took the time out of their life to read my kids' blog posts without being required to, liked it or commented on it. I mean, kids are just blown away that people value their ideas that much. Yeah, that that's great. Actually, that leads to one of my next questions is, um, do you have any suggestions of things that you, you can do to help your students reach a wider audience? I think sometimes people find blogs by accident. Um, but, yes. But, so um, but not always. And if your students want a wider audience, what can they do to to find that? Okay, so first of all, um, but the one thing I do want to say to all teachers is if you want your kids to blog, you need to blog. And you need to blog so that you understand the struggles they're going through. Um, I actually, this year, created a blog that I'm not going to tell you about. And I created it just to remind myself of what it's like at the very beginning to have a blog where nobody knows that you're, you know, like I didn't, I didn't put my name on it. I didn't tell my friends about it. I just started blogging again on this other kind of like little side project just to remind myself. It was hard getting views. It's hard getting people to, to notice me or anything like that. And so I, it's definitely important to do this so you can kind of see what it's like. So here are the things that I do. Number one, on my blog, I have a thing called blog, blog sharing. And you can go there and you can see all of my students' blogs. And I would say 30 to 50% of my kids' blogs, especially if they don't have a more popular blog, come just from people visiting that and then checking out my kids' blogs. So you've got to have somewhere where public that people can go and see your kids' blogs. I also have a Pinterest page. The Pinterest page, I think, is much more visual. And I pin, I don't pin all the blogs. I pin the blog posts that I really like. So if you go to my Pinterest page, you can actually see, and that's also linked, the Pinterest page is linked back to my blog share page, so you can find all those resources there. I also tweet out kids' blogs that I really like. Um, but now, things that the kids can do. So number one, my kids who aren't very good at getting their stuff out there, they're terrible at tagging, and you've got to tag your posts appropriately. So... Uh, when you're blogging, make sure, like if you're writing about Harry Potter, then put Harry Potter in as a tag and maybe put, you know, um, some of the characters that you mentioned and, and things like that. So you've got to put those in because then pe that's what, how people find it on Google. And then you've got to 
when you put Harry Potter in your blog, you've got to highlight that and then link that to a Harry Potter wiki because Google puts every linked phrase in your writing that helps bump it up on the page as like a, um, that this is a valued resource because it's, mm -hmm. it's the links going out and it's the links coming in that pushes it up on the Google search engine. So you got to talk to your kids about search engine optimization a little bit. And then also when they do go to share it out on Twitter, now their Twitter accounts aren't very big. They don't have that many followers, but they can use a hashtag. If, if, if my kid posts a blog post on Twitter and hashtags at Harry Potter, it will get views. And so use the hashtag on Instagram or on Twitter. Um, and also my kids, they're very reluctant at first to share anything on Facebook because that's where all their friends and family see it and they're kind of embarrassed. But once they write something they're proud of and they share it there, they're stunned when they, oh my gosh, so many people looked at it and reshared it. Like I have parents who have commented on their kids' blogs because they're just blown away with what their kids are writing and they want to share it with their aunts and their uncles and their relatives and everybody. Like, And how, how many times does a dad ask a kid to share a paper that you've brought home from school? Like, right. Like with my little comments on it, never, but a blog post. Yes. Those are all really good ideas. And I'm also think that Twitter is a wonderful tool to introduce students to. So I like the way you're tying that in. Yeah. With blogging. I mean, I think they work really well together. I know sure. whenever I do a blog post, I tweet out, the post and I think that's how most of the people find find my posts yeah. you know, and the hashtags are so powerful because it can get people who don't follow you. Yeah. Sure and, and you know the other nice thing about hashtags too is it allows your students to think about what is the most crucial element of my writing and where is my you know it's it's uh, it's the kind of things you would see in the old library search right you know the little index cards and what are the things that the topics that are being covered here right and it's search engine stuff and it's so and it's it's when you make a hashtag it's almost like you're making a thesis statement so there's a lot of um oh, what's the word I'm looking for here I don't know there's a lot of skills developed when you're using the hashtags there's another word I'm looking for and I just lost it because I'm getting too old I'll think of the word in like five minutes Okay. Well, I think it's just part of the many critical thinking skills that are developed. That's the word. <laughs> Through the blogging and, and, and tweeting as well. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jane. You're well, good. These are some great suggestions and some that um, I'm going to start using um, the, I, um, the tagging. I have um, classes I've been working on. I have not been working with them on that, so I need to start doing that. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. Um, do you have any suggestions um, of, you know, any issues you encounter to that people could help people avoid um, as they start blogging or anything I haven't covered, we haven't covered that um, you'd like to share? Um, as far as student blogging, as far as personal blogging? Students. Um, I am, I, I, I think... Um, Adult blogging is really important too. I was focusing on student blogging. Okay, all right, just making sure. Yeah. Um, no, I think okay. So you're going to need something. So I, I have a spreadsheet where I have all of the students' first name, last name, period, where their blog is, their blogging login, and then their password. So I and and I really have almost never needed to use the ability to get into their blogs and change something that I saw was inappropriate. I think the fact that they know I have the login and password keeps that a little bit down. And then you have to, once you make that, if you're doing this in a Google doc, you need to actually pull it offline because Google, the first time I did that actually went and, and uh, disabled that document for me entering it because they thought I was collecting username and passwords as a hacker. So, so, so have that spreadsheet, but then download it somewhere or keep it just on your desktop or something like that. But I think that's really useful. Um, I actually, uh, I have an LMS now. So when the kids ter submit their blog post, it just goes right into the grading program and I can grade it right there. But before I did that, I actually made a Google form that the kids weekly would just 
dump their uh, current blog post into the Google form, and then it would populate a spreadsheet by week, so I could just go in there and see them all. So you will have to do a little bit of organizational stuff at the beginning to figure out how are my kids going to get this stuff to me, and I'm going to be able to look at it, and then, you know, whatever. And I know some people, they'll only look at, like, every other kid's blog post or just send me your best two because they can't look at them all. One of my favorite complaints I get from people is, what happens if the kids write too much? And that's my favorite complaint to hear, right? Because it's like, oh man, what happens if the kids write too much? Like, I won't be able to read it all. And that's like the most awesome problem in the world to have as an English teacher is that your kids are going to write too much and that they're going to like it too much. And so don't worry about that. Like, you figure that out. Um, but that's an awesome problem to have. Yeah, really. No. <laughs> Hey, um, these are all really great ideas. I really appreciate your sharing. And I, um, what I'll do afterwards is get links to your blog with the links to the students' blogs and the Pinterest board and share that along with um, the interview when I post it. Does that sound okay? Yeah, and if people just go to Bitly, and by the way, if you're not using Bitly, you should, but it's just bit.ly backslash David T. EDU blogs. So that's bit.ly backslash David T EDU blogs. You will go to my blogging page and I have resources there, not just for myself, but also from William Chamberlain and Linda Yolis and other people who are blogging. There's a spreadsheet there of blog posts in other subjects besides English. So if you want to see people who are blogging in science or in math or different things like that, there's a spreadsheet there so you can check those out. Um, there's lots of resources there, so if you just go there, you can find stuff. You can find me on Twitter at David T. Edu. I'm really good about responding on Twitter because I know you're not going to write me something long, and I'm not going to write you something long back. So just hit me up there, and if I can't help you quickly, I can send you a link to a resource that will help you out. Okay, that sounds great. Um, thank you, um, David, for your time, and um, thanks to all the people out there watching this afterwards. See you later. Thank you, Jane.